Now say this out loud as you're driving around in your car. Joint sports skillet. This is what it feels like. So how do you like it? So what is it? I'm curious. You like it like this? My God, do we love football. Or like this. I love the sport of baseball. And what about this? You can have a sports show without all the vicious talk. Simple human decency. Whatever it is that you like. Yeah, I like chaos. We've got it covered. Right? Right? It's sports the way you like it. My friends, you may not know this. It's got everything you want. Here we go. Local and national sports talk that's fresh, in season, and FDA approved. If it's hot, you'll find it cooking with Jeff, Jay, and Kelly. Mm -mm. They don't just stir the pot. They add more flavor than the other guys. Get ready to dig in and taste some sports skillet. Tastes good. Right now. And we are back here on Friday afternoon with the Sports Scale live stream. And what a week in sports it has been. The NFL has returned. They've kicked off the preseason. We had the Giants going up against the New York Jets. We had the Eagles losing to the Tennessee Titans. They uh, lost, actually, Jeff. They lost. They did. The The Eagles lost. The first preseason game, and they lost. Okay. They did. uh, They lost to a lowly Tennessee. It's not even the official game. Um, um, I'm going back to Madden, okay? Okay. At least they'll win in that game. You know, <laughs> you restart when you're losing. <laughs> Darn right, I do. <laughs> I'm sure the Eagles would have liked to restart yesterday too. I bet you. That was just sad. It, it, not a good way for the Eagles to uh, begin the preseason uh, with a loss. Uh, there was a couple of players that kind of stood out in the game, but. Uh, You know, it was just a heartbreaking loss for uh, the Eagle fans. We expected the Eagles to come out, show out, do really well. A lot of the starters were benched for the game yesterday. So, of course, that contributed to it. But now you have the injury to the Eagles' backup quarterback. Uh, Doug Peterson said after the game that it wasn't going to be a season-ending injury. But now you're looking at possibly Cody Kessler being the Eagles' backup to start the season instead of Nate Sudfeld. Or you're looking at the Eagles maybe going out and turning over rocks and kicking over trash cans and trying to find some backup quarterback. Now, Twitter kind of exploded last night with the thoughts of Colin Kaepernick coming in and being the Eagles' backup quarterback. Um, You know, they tried the uh, media last night after the game, tried to get Doug Peterson to bite on if the Eagles were going to go out and sign a backup quarterback off, you know, you know, that's, on the street somewhere and let me tell you the quarterbacks that are out there are not very good they're out there for a reason um i heard ray dinger on the post game show say that josh johnson is out there he might be the best of the lot and you all and he has a little bit of mobility but you know we want to know on our social media feed um would you be comfortable with um, you know, now that Nate Sudfeld is out, would you be comfortable with bringing in a Colin Kaepernick or a Josh Johnson, or would you be comfortable going with Cody Kessler, who really did not look good last night as your backup quarterback for maybe the first few weeks, maybe month, month and a half of the season until um, Nate Sudfeld's uh, wrist heals. Now, the good part about it is that Uh, The wrist injury is not, as Doug Peterson explained it, is not on his throwing hand. So that helps out a little bit. But still, uh, it looks like uh, Nate Sudfeld is going to be sidelined for at least the first little bit of the season. So you're looking at Cody Kessler um, as probably your backup quarterback. Or do you bring in 
Or let me ask Mike here. You know, do you think the Eagles should bring in a Colin Kaepernick? Question really should be that if the Eagles bring in Colin Kaepernick, are they prepared to handle the backlash? Kaepernick's been the subject of major scrutiny over the past few years with his controversial Nike ads, yep. with his kneeling for the national anthem as a protest over police brutality. He's been through a lot the past few years. I'm sure he's been working on his game in case he gets that call, but teams yep. are going to have some reservations about him. Exactly. And if he gets signed, that team, the team that signs him, is going to have to deal with the backlash. Exactly. And we don't know what kind of shape. I mean, Colin Kaepernick posted a video recently, but he hasn't played football in quite a while, so we don't know what kind of a foot, what kind of quote unquote football shape uh, he's actually in. So, well, he kneels all the time. He's probably not that great. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, still I, a little I, soon for that one. <laughs> no, it's never too soon, especially when we're talking about a controversial <laughs> subject like that. I mean, yeah. you, ha- you have to bring it in if we're going to talk about it. You, yeah, it, it, it's the caboose of the um, the whole conversation. You bring Kaepernick in, you have to bring that. Like you're saying, can they deal with the backlash? I mean, it's like bringing back uh, Michael Vick with the dog issues. Oh uh, yeah, dog fight. You have to include that in that. And it, this is even Eagles worse. Ha- the Eagles handled that well when they brought in Michael Vick. The question mm-hmm. is, can they deal with the with the police brutality issues, with his protests, yep. with his Nike controversy exactly. when they bring but, in Kaepernick? This is a whole different animal than Vick. True. Which is, uh, I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't trying to do Bravo. anything. <laughs> I like it. But, I mean, the controversy behind that, it's a little yeah. bit more than animal cruelty. 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 Wow, it's still early morning for me. Wow. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> so, Jeff is just. You're running of, on mountain time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that jet lag, you know, of driving in. Ooh. Exactly. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying with the whole controversy coming back? It's just, especially with the. It's a national thing, too, dealing with yeah, this. Yeah, and it's national news that and, co- yeah, happened and, and Vic dealt with. Yourself, yep. Should we have a, any kind of political thing in the NFL? I mean,. How many other people do you see making statements? It's First Amendment, man. I know they're it's the first exercising ma- their First Amendment rights. I understand, but we come here to watch football and enjoy a game and try to forget all that stuff, and then to have it brought in. I mean, it was talked about on uh, last week's um, radio program, Jay. You brought it up yourself. It's, this yep. is a sports talk show, not a political talk show. Yep. Same thing with the stream, but we have to address yep. it real quick. But we it, don't have it, to go into it. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, when yep. you're when you're talking about signing a Colin Kaepernick, there's a lot of baggage that goes in there, mm-hmm. and you're bringing him in as a backup quarterback. But he's going to get as much or more attention as your starting quarterback, which in this case would be Carson Wentz. So you know that's uh, you know that's a whole thing that if you're going to bring in a Colin Kaepernick, it you know are you prepared to deal with that? And then what happens? Of course, when, uh, when the Eagles when back Sudfeld up, returns. when Sudfeld returns. Now, all of a sudden, what do you do with Kaepernick? Because Kaepernick is going to, I, I won't say he's going to sign a really lucrative deal. You're not going to have to pay him a whole bunch because um, he hasn't played since hasn't 2014. Play, hasn't played in, exactly. And so you don't know what type of football shape he's in. And he's got to kind of prove himself. But again, as Doug Peterson said, Sudfeld's injury isn't isn't season ending. So he's going to be coming back at some point and it's not his throwing arm. So there's not going to be as much rehab going on uh, with that. So again, now you're going to have Sudfeld, you're going to have Kaepernick there. You know, you're going to have a whole thing going on with your Kessler quarterback there. You're going to have Wentz as yep. your starter. Exactly. Wentz so it's going to be week one starter. No question about that. Oh yeah. At least he so, didn't get himself hurt, so that's good. <laughs> well, he didn't play yesterday, so he didn't get himself Wentz hurt. Wentz was benched yesterday, yeah. so no yep. reason yeah. to worry about an injury with Carson Wentz. True. Well, exactly. Isn't it a bad omen when the backup quarterback gets hurt? I mean, even though it's minor, it's like, eh, and then well, they lose. Well, again, uh, that's true. Know. You're too superstitious, Jeff. Well, well that's true. And we then, are talking about sports here. I'm wearing my. Good underwear for this season, so... Uh, All right. To bring the Eagles luck. It's okay, Mike. They're clean. (laughs) I actually clean them every week. That's Okay, that's good. You know. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) This is not uh, the time nor the place to bring that up. But, um, 
But yeah, but with Carson Wentz, he hasn't made it through a season, be it college or be it in the pros, without getting some form, without, without getting, getting an nicked, injury, without getting nicked up, without getting an injury. Exactly. So that backup quarterback is extremely important because you may need him for a game or two. And um, are you comfortable, you know, with go, Kaepernick? With Kaepernick, and then releasing Kaepernick, and what happens when you have to do that? You know, or what happens when Wentz gets injured, and you'll be, and you may need Kaepernick, or you may just need, in case. and then, and then Kaepernick becomes your starting quarterback, and then let's say Kaepernick does well, and then, and then the contract controversy because yep. he wants the money Wentz wants, and da 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 yeah, da, exactly, and he becomes a Boris client, exactly. as I call him. I don't know. I don't. That would be interesting. I don't know if Boris would sign Kaepernick or not. You know. Because of his political affiliation, but if the NFL was willing to bring him back, and he, you know, and Kaepernick could get signed by a team, who knows? Boris might swoop in. You know, that would I be. I call a- any player that wants a whole load of money just to play a Boris client, because Scott Boris wants his players to command a whole bunch of money just to play for a team. This is true. You know, you look at the Boris clients, he gets his clients money. Now, he may not put his clients where they really want to play, but he does... But he commands the money. But he does get them the money. This is a sports business. This is a sports agency business. It's cutthroat. It's crooked. It's all around yeah. bad news. Well, do the players prove themselves that they deserve that money? Uh, at some point they do it. at some point they do because he gets them that money so they get to a point where teams where they are, deserve that money where they yeah. deserve it and then they hold out for as much money as they can get I mean <coughs> Lady Ondell exactly <laughs> that comes back to another conversation we had yeah. last week where they hold out for the money I'm like well why don't you get out there and prove yourself like <coughs> I'm, I'm ground. Yeah, thank you like get out there prove that you earn that money and you deserve that contract renegotiation or whatever this way you can't <laughs> yeah that's who i was just gonna that's who i was just gonna bring up is big zeke exactly you know it, you know out on his out on his little island going head to head with jerry jones ezekiel's island well it's not that little i mean come on it's yeah. pretty ezekiel's decent size. island yeah, i mean Did he, he go on a three-hour tour on the ss minnow <laughs> he may have to get out there he, i mean he probably took his time getting out there you know on uh, you know on a on a nice cruise ship you know go <laughs> you know uh, going out to the island and you know doing and now we don't even know what kind of shape Zeke is in. He, uh, Zeke isn't posting any workout videos or anything like that so we don't know what type of football shape Zeke is in and um, as an Eagle fan I love seeing this controversy with the Dallas Cowboys because in my mind the Dallas Cowboys aren't as good without Ezekiel Elliott as they are with him so the more uh, Zeke holds out the worst shape he comes in at, you know, the better it is for the Philadelphia Eagles. And this season won't count towards his NFL service. Uh, yes, it will. Yes, it will, because he, the more he doesn't show up to camp, he's getting fined. The dollar amount is racking up. So he's going to have to pay the Cowboys whatever contract he ends up signing with the Cowboys. A portion of that is going back to the Cowboys because uh, they, uh, they're they finding him each day that he's out of camp. I thought the rule was that if he doesn't report to camp within a month of the season starting, Party. the season wouldn't count. Um, I got to double check that, but I, know, I do know he's getting fined. I do know, I do know that. He might um, lose his boat if he's not careful. He could. He might have to I pilot mean, it himself. With, it's like, you know, ah. with the fines. I mean, same thing with Le'Veon. I mean, he wasn't showing up, so he got fined last year um, for not showing up. So, I, so I, I'm sorry, Jay. Yeah. If I ever had a job and yeah. I decided I'm not going to go to work at all, I, I wouldn't be fined. I'd be fired. Exactly. I'm sorry. Did I miss something? Well, I see, only in the NFL. <laughs> only in the NFL Maybe can you not go to work and probably get a better contract than the one that you currently have. Yeah, only in the NFL. I'm in the wrong business. 
Yeah. Can I sit on the sideline and pretend I can actually play and then say I'm holding out for more money? Hey, if you, <laughs> if you can get an NFL team to sign, yeah, absolutely. I think that ship for you sailed 20 years ago. No, 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 no. I can still do it. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'll, I'll just go play baseball. I mean, you know, there's no... Never mind. Hmm. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't see help. you. I don't. Oh. <laughs> you know. Don't get me started on now. Now you get me started on the Phillies. And like what you did, Jeff. Like what you did. <laughs> what? It's you called got... Segway. Exactly. You'll pick up on it quick. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so now you got me started on the Phillies. And oh my gosh, uh, another the, tough loss. Another tough loss. Now they are literally tied with the, the New Mets. York Mets. The Mets. And something that, Chicago <laughs> and I'm taking it back. <laughs> and, uh, and now the Phillies are tied with the Mets, something that I predicted. I've been predicting for the past few weeks that the Mets you would predicted this back on July 14th. Yes. That the Mets would overtake the Philadelphia Phillies. Why? Because I saw the Mets having a better starting pitching staff, which saves the bullpen. Number one, I saw the Mets, uh, coming on, they had an easy part of their schedule, which they kind of just got through. And historically, they've been a better second half team, as exactly. I mentioned a couple yep. weeks ago. This is the St. Louis Blues all over again. It could be. We could be watching the St. Louis Blues all over again. A team that was left for dead, that wanted to fire their manager, in this case, Mickey Calloway, a team that. Um, wanted to almost lynch their general manager that was lost, that was going after uh, media members in the locker room, now all of a sudden has gotten a swagger about him, has gotten a new hashtag that they threw out there, have gotten a whole bunch of confidence in them, and, and now they've tied the Phillies, and I believe by the end of the weekend we'll be ahead of the Phillies, Probably by Saturday night, will the Phillies will be looking up at the New York Mets. Probably by the end of tonight, today is Friday when we're taping this. Probably by the end of tonight, uh, when the two teams play, the Phillies will wind up looking up at the Mets. And, you know, you look at it, and, uh, and the Phillies manager uh, has not been able to get them out of this Losing out streak hole, out of this rut, out of this rut, out of, out of just cratering. It happened to the Phillies last year um, in early August. Phillies were cruising along first place. Everything was kind of looking nice. And then the bottom just dropped out. They cratered. And we all know um, that they missed the playoffs last year. Same thing happened to them this year. They're cruising along end of May. Bottom falls out, and they just have not been able to recover. And you got to look at the manager. You got to look at the coaching staff on that uh, for not holding the players accountable. For not, for um, uh, Gabe Kapler not uh, putting together steady lineups, switching people in and out of the lineup, up and down the lineup. A, part, a player could have a good game one day and then be and sitting on the bench the next. next. This is what I accused Mickey Cowley of doing last year. Exactly, and now it's and now it's come south. It's come what south about, west to Philadelphia. 90, it's come southwest about ninety miles. Exactly. You, you know, the, Jay, I have a great idea for the Phillies of what they could do sure. to make themselves a lot better. Get rid of the manager they have. Okay. Put the fanatic in charge. <laughs> I hey. say he could put together a better team. In fact, we could do more of a Harlem Globetrotter thing. At least it'll be fun to watch the games this time instead of like you know what what is it now fourth place and losing. I'm like oh yeah, you know, uh, I, yep, I, I absolutely. It, I'm just throwing that out there. And the team is and the team has <laughs> no signs of life whatsoever. It's like a it's like a country club atmosphere. You know, it's like okay, I'll you know I'll come to the ballpark. I'll you know, be in the lineup or I won't be. We'll see what Gabe Kapler does. You know, send, uh, send the good players to other teams where they can be useful and just bring all the bad players here and figured, hey, why not? Seems well, to be what we're doing. You know, and <laughs> and I can't criticize uh, Matt Clintock uh, for going out and signing some mediocre relievers at the trade deadline because 
it was a country club lifestyle that the team is leading. They didn't have any uh, oomph about them. They didn't have any swagger. They didn't have any heart about them. So why go out and give up uh, some of your best prospects for a team that is going to finish in fourth place out of the playoffs, only ahead of the Florida Marlins, who, by the way, I believe have a have a better head-to-head record um, against the Phillies. So why why give up prospects for this team that's going to finish in fourth place? I wouldn't do it. I think Matt Klintock did a good job there. But where he didn't do a good job is recently, within the past week, we've seen uh, third baseman Mikel Franco demoted to AAA. Uh, and we've seen Adam Hazley demoted to AAA. Two I'm not going to say that Mikel Franco was hitting great because he was hitting, um, I think it was uh, 212 or something like that since uh, the end of May. Not a good batting average, but still had some pops, still could pull out of it, still gives you uh, some pretty good defense. And instead, they stay with Sean Rodriguez. Are you kidding me? You know, are you are you trying to tell me that Sean Rodriguez gives you more power off the bench? And they demote Adam Hazley again, who gives you power, who gives you a good batting average? Are you kidding me, Matt Clentock? Give me a break. I mean, they keep two uh, 200, uh, 200 average hitters with little to no pop. Although if you or although if you listen to Gabe Kapler, he'll tell you that these guys hit monster home runs and they're pure power hitters and that is just utter garbage they should have gotten rid of those two guys and by the way the quote from Gabe Kapler is Miguel Franco can only play one position well Gabe wasn't it just a year ago or a year and a half ago where uh, we understood that Mikel Franco could at least fill in at first base on occasion and maybe give uh, the Phillies' first baseman a blow once in a while and let him catch his breath and a day off. Miguel Franco can play third or first base. He can do it. So he can play multiple positions if you need him to. All you got to realize is that Scott Kingery can play multiple positions in the infield, leave him there, let him play second, short, or third, and just leave... Uh, And you should have just left Hazley up there to play center field, platoon with Quinn. That's fine. Boom. You're set there. You know, you activate Jay Bruce, which they did. Have him platoon in left field, and you're fine there. Just hide away Kingery's outfield glove. You don't need him there anymore if you just, you know, kept these guys and you, and you, Demoted them for worse hitters. I put up the stats on Facebook last night between the guys that they kept and Miguel Franco. And Miguel Franco beat him in just about every category. It's just unbelievable how you think you're in a pennant race and Clintac does that to the team. It just killed. And then Gabe Kapler comes. Just killed the momentum. Why don't we take the entire Phillies coaching staff, and push them somewhere else. That's what everybody wants to do in the city of Philadelphia. I don't think Gabe Kapler survives. Uh, He's done. The, I Lynch think, him. Yes. I believe I'm with you right there, Mike. Get him. The, get Gabe Cap. I was once a supporter of Gabe Kapler. I gave him a chance. I said, okay, the team cratered last year at the end of the season. Let's give Gabe Kapler a chance. Let's see if he can learn from his mistakes like, I don't know, another coach in the city of Philadelphia, uh, that being uh, Doug Peterson, who uh, self-scouts himself, his staff, and looks over his mistakes that he may be making and makes changes. Gabe Kapler apparently doesn't learn from his mistakes, Goes out, keeps making the same thing. It's my way or the highway. Why I'm did he not <laughs> talk to Doug Peterson? He should have. Yeah. Doug Peterson can give him lessons in coaching. And by the way, for Matt Clintock and Andy McPhail to have all this faith in Kapler, let's just review the fact that 
Gabe Kapler didn't have any coaching experience before the Phillies handed him this uh, managerial position. He coached one season at, a, I believe it was A-ball, um, in the Dodgers organization before he went into the uh, Dodgers front office. And that was it for his on-field coaching ability. Now, you know, some people, they can... Bad hire. That was a bad hire. It, it's turning out to be, absolutely. Um, you know, some people are good at being in the front office. Some people are good at being a manager on the field, like Charlie Manuel, good manager on the field. Larry Boa. La- Larry Boa was a good manager on the field, exactly. Not necessarily... Uh, guys that I would want in my front office, I'd want them down, you know, on the field in a managerial role or a coaching role, that type of thing. Gabe Kampler may be one of those guys who's not suited to be a manager, but is suited to be an advisor or in the front office somewhere, uh, something like that. That may be Gabe Kampler's calling. Um, you know, that that may just be his calling. Billy Bean, for example, um moneyball you know tried it as a player um i don't believe he was ever a manager but is i believe a good front office guy a good general manager omar Manaya is another one omar Manaya, exactly you know um so you have these guys and sometimes it's the second or third stop that these guys make uh, coaches or managers make where they actually come they into come, their own. Yeah, where they come into their own, where they learn from their mistakes from their first stop. Exactly. And uh, Joe Torre is a good example of that. Um, Joe Torre, former manager of the Mets, goes to the Cardinals, but it wasn't really until he, he got, got to the, to the Yankees, Yankees where he really came into his own, where he started to win championships. Exactly, and he pe- got the players to win championships, win games, and really get into the Hall of Fame mindset. Get to the Hall of Fame. Yep, as a and be able to coach him, and and that's the thing. And that may be the case with Kapler, but so far, to me, as manager of the Phillies, he had his chance last year, and he failed, and he, and failed. he failed miserably. Yeah. And hey, he, hey, Jay, did you hear yeah. that? It, it sounds like Kapler's second. Uh, Second chance. Well, here's the thing, too. A, a report came out this week, and I saw it on Twitter. A report came out that apparently if Gabe Kapler is released by the Phillies, uh, the San Francisco Giants would swoop down and hire him in a second. I don't know why, but apparently they would to take over for Bruce Bochy. Um I don't think that would be a good hire for the for the Giants. I would rather Gabe Kapler be a bench coach or a third base coach or an assistant coach somewhere. More demoted than trained. Yeah. Or exactly. Or or go or or go to a triple A team and manage that team. Learn a little bit more about how to uh, get a team to win the entire season rather than cratering and bottoming out and all this losing going on. You know, learn a little bit more. Learn from another manager before you get another managerial opportunity. Hey, Cut. send him to the Trent Thunder. <laughs> Maybe. There you yeah. go. A minor league team. He could ply his trade. He could learn a little bit. From the from uh, other coaches on the Trent Thunder, do you think he you're has not... a chip on his shoulder? Maybe he doesn't feel like he can learn anything from other people. I don't Maybe know. because he he obviously hasn't learned anything from uh, from last year, and and now uh, there was a Bob Nightingale article that came out this week about Gabe Kapler, which uh, which was astounding to me. Uh, just a first paragraph about his bulging biceps and oh, and God. and everything like that, and then it got and then it got worse, and then it got worse from there um, about how uh, the front office and Andy McPhail and Matt Clintock are in love with Gabe Kapler because he pitches in and helps sell tickets with the ticket office and makes phone calls and does all these. 
uh, reports and stuff like that and pitches in in other areas. Well, here's the thing. Here's my bottom line. If you have a team that's cratering right now, that is struggling to win ball games, that is struggling to win series, that went from three and a half games up at the end of May to now fourth place in your division behind the New York Mets, maybe, just maybe, guys, that manager better focus on his team, his players, his coaching staff, and what's going on in the locker room, and not so much all this other stuff about writing reports and helping to sell tickets with the ticket office and all this extra stuff and just worry about winning series and why does my team continue to lose series after series, uh, three games in a row. Why can't I get this team back to where it was in April and in May and instead of doing all this other stuff? Why do I think he's doing it? Uh, Jeff, you you and I both work for uh, Lockheed Martin. They always say try to the best thing you can do is try to make yourself more valuable for doing other stuff. Right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, kind of that, that. that was, you know, that was kind of refrain, you know, get trained in other areas. And if the more valuable you can make yourself to a, a company or organization, you know, the more things you can do, the tougher it is to let you go, you know. Well, yeah, that, that's if you keep the knowledge to yourself. If you uh, give it to other people, that's one thing. Yeah. So, you know, that's what... Um, that's kind of what I think Gabe Kapler is maybe has in the back of his mind is that I know I'm going to get fired. I'm in real danger of getting fired. I've pretty much lost the Philly fan base. So let me try to make myself as valuable as I can to the organization to by doing from getting fired. Yeah. He's trying to make himself more valuable, but yep. I think this might be too little too late. I believe you are correct. Philly fan base wants him gone, wants him out of there. Uh, he's lost all credibility right now with the Philly fan base, and uh, they definitely want him out. Absolutely. Um, the so fan base is your judge, your jury, and your executioner. It when is. When it comes to being manager. It is. It yeah. absolutely is. And right now, the fan base is the executioner. They are, and they want, and they want him ex- executed big time, let me tell you. Um, but right now, what we're going to do is kind of reset the show a little bit. Oh, we I'll hit the reset button. Hold on. We will, okay. <laughs> Jeff has hit the reset button. So, uh, we are going to take a little bit of a time out right now and we're going to pay some bills and, uh, That's right. we will, we will have a commercial break and maybe we will have Pat Ragazzo calling in any minute. So uh, stay tuned for Pat Ragazza. We're going to talk Mets. We're going to talk Giants with him. Giants had their first preseason game last night. We're going to get his opinion on what he thinks about uh, the Giants' first preseason game. Uh, They suffered an injury last night, so we're going to be talking about that as well. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back after this. This commercial break. Now say this out loud as you're driving around in your car. Joint sports skillet. This is what it feels like. So how do you like it? So what is it? I'm curious. You like it like this? My God, do we love football. Or like this. I love the sport of baseball. And what about this? You can have a sports show without all the vicious talk. Simple human decency. Whatever it is that you like. Yeah, I like chaos. We've got it covered. Right? Right? It's sports the way you like it. My friends, you may not know this. It's got everything you want. Here we go. Local and national sports talk that's fresh, in season, and FDA approved. If it's hot, you'll find it cooking with Jeff, Jay, and Kelly. Mm -mm. They don't just stir the pot. They add more flavor than the other guys. Get ready to dig in and taste some sports skillet. Tastes good.
Remember the TV show Cheers, where everybody knows your name? Never been there. But every time I walk into Wildflowers Restaurant on Pennington Circle, I feel at home and that I belong. Friday night, I headed over to Wildflowers, and even though it was packed, I easily found a seat at the bar and got cozy with 17 TVs. Baseball, golf, entertainment TV, you name it, including all NFL games. The bartender Dave suggested I order the Buffalo Wing Sampler, and you could tell he was a fervid fan. But reviews on Wildflowers in Restaurant Facebook page demanded I tried the garbage truck pizza, and Kelly had just arrived and promised to help me dig in. Then it came. Garbage truck pizza does not live up to its name because it smells amazing and it tastes even better. Freshly sliced peppers and pepperoni, garlic, mushrooms, mozzarella, and meatballs all baked on this incredibly crunchy and warm double crust to hold it all together perfectly. Heaven, especially with one of their 23 beers on tap. I'm a believer. Go to wildflowersinrestaurant.com for more info or just come in. They are conveniently located on the Pennington Circle, right near I-95. I promise you, they will welcome you warmly, feed you well, and perhaps soon even know your name. Welcome to This Week in Sports History, sponsored by Wildflowers Restaurant on the Painted Circle. I am Jeff Soner. Let's dive right into the history books. On August 12th in 1994, Major League Baseball players went on strike, causing the cancellation of the World Series and delaying the opening of the 1995 season. This was the eighth work stoppage in baseball history. After 232 days, the strike was suspended on April 2nd, 1995. A salary cap was proposed by owners due to the worsening financial situation in baseball. Ownership claimed that small market clubs would fall by the wayside unless teams agreed to share local broadcasting revenues. The dispute played out with a backdrop of years of hostility and mistrust between the two sides, including an absence of an official commissioner since the owners forced Faye Vincent to resign in September 1992. One result of the strike was the Montreal Expos, who were having their best season in franchise history as well as the best record in baseball at 74 and 40 stopped by the strike. The Expos are now the Washington Nationals. On August 13th in 1910, the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Brooklyn Super Boys, later the Dodgers, played to an 8-8 tie in the second game of a doubleheader at Washington Park. What made this tie unique was that both teams had 38 at-bats, 13 hits, 12 assists, 2 errors, 5 strikeouts, 3 walks, 1 pass ball, and 1 hit by pitch. On August 14th in 1959, the first league meeting was held in Chicago for the American Football League. Charter memberships were given to Dallas, New York, Houston, Denver, Los Angeles, and Minneapolis. The AFL operated for 10 seasons when in 1969 it merged with the National Football League. The AFL operated in direct competition with the more established NFL. As fierce competition made player salaries skyrocket in both leagues, especially after a series of raids, the leagues agreed to merge in 1966. Conditions for the merger included a common draft and championship game played between the two leagues, a game that would later evolve into the Super Bowl. On August 15th in 2007, the NBA betting scandal hit a new low when then-NBA referee Tim Donahue pleaded guilty to two federal charges related to the investigation and a year later was sentenced to 15 months in prison and three years of supervised release. In his guilty plea, Donaghy said he participated in a scheme to deprive the NBA of his honest services. I was in a unique position to predict the outcome of NBA games, he said, as he was paid to make picks on games. The result of the scandal was that referees would now be allowed to engage in several forms of betting, though not 
on sports. On August 17th in 1972, Philadelphia Phillies Hall of Fame pitcher Steve Carlton would win his 15th consecutive game, a 9-4 complete game over the Cincinnati Reds. Carlton would go 29-12 with a 1.97 ERA in 346 and a third innings pitch to go with 310 strikeouts. This incredible season would earn him the Cy Young Award. Carlton also finished fifth in the MVP voting in 19. 1972. On August 18th in 1965, slugger Hank Aaron had a home run taken away from him because he hit it while standing outside the batter's box. The monster home run appeared to break the game open for Atlanta, but Cardinals catcher Bob Euchre was having a cow jumping up and down and yelling at the home plate umpire because he said Aaron had his entire left foot out of the box. The umpire agreed and Aaron was called out. Aaron said, it's the worst call I've ever seen. I did the same thing the time before and popped up and the umpire did not say a word. Really, I blame the whole thing on that damn euchre. Thank you for listening to This Week in Sports History, sponsored by Wildflowers Restaurant on the Painted Circle. I am Jeff Selner. All right, and we are back here on the Sports Skillet Radio Show live stream. Thank you for joining us each and every Friday afternoon. Pat Rogazzo is just running a few minutes late, so he should be joining us in a few minutes. A reminder to everyone out there, we also do the live show every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. on Fox Sports Radio at 920 The Jersey. So you want to tune into that as well. And we will have a unique opportunity. Stay tuned to our social media pages, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, We will be putting out there a unique opportunity. We want to have you uh, join us uh, for that unique opportunity that will be coming out. It's going to be a pick'em league. And uh, we're going to have you maybe play against Joe Montana, the Hall of Fame quarterback. So, again, stay tuned to our social media pages, and uh, we will be giving you all that information coming up. Uh, As I said, we're going to start getting into uh, the Giants preseason game last night. Uh, We had some players look pretty good on the Giants. Uh, We had um, uh, such as Daniel Jones. He looks like he may be ready to roll for the New York Giants. So the big question then is going to be how much longer does Eli Manning have um, as starting quarterback for the Giants? We know Eli is going to be starting week one for the Giants, but will he be starting much beyond week one? That is the question. What do you think, Mike? Eli's definitely the week one starter, no question about that. He's been the week one starter since, I think, 2005. But the way Daniel Jones looked, Eli better watch his back because if Eli makes one mistake, Jones is going to come in and he's going to be succeeding Eli in the future. No question about that. I had some reservations about Daniel Jones. I wanted Dwayne Haskins so badly on draft night. But Jones is... Jones has proven himself in week one of the preseason. I expect him to be proving himself again week two against Chicago and even further down the line as we get into the regular season when opportunities present themselves. I agree. I agree. I think what could hurt Eli is the fact that he, the Giants have a number of wide receivers that are not going to play at least the first few games of the regular season. Yeah, they have Corey Coleman out with the ACL. They yep. have Golden Tate out with his suspension. The only good target that Eli has is Sterling Shepard. They do have some rookie wideouts that Eli can target, but it's really going to be up to the receivers to keep Eli in the duration of the season. If they can't catch his passes, if they're not on the same page as Eli, it's going to be up to Daniel Jones to step in and take some of the slack. And that's where where I think the issue would be is that 
Eli may not Eli may be playing well, but he doesn't have the the receivers the receivers him around him. Now he might not have the offensive line to back him up either. Exactly. That was that was probably his problem last year. He did not have the offensive line to back him up. He had the receivers, he just didn't have the line. Exactly. And now so, he doesn't have the receivers, but he has the line to back him and up. And he has a very good running back. Saquon but Bar Saquon Barkley's a machine. He is a monster. Give him the ball and good things will happen. Exactly. And and he can burn you with his legs, he can burn you with his hands. I see good things coming out of Saquon Barkley this year. Probably another two thousand yard season. I he's I could see him having a very good season. I mean the Giants are definitely gonna ride him early in the season because they essentially they have to now. Um with the wide receiver situation being what I it is. I expected the Giants to pick up Sam Darnold at number two the year they drafted Barkley. But they got Barkley and oh my god. Go picking fantasy league this year. Really? Okay. I'm I'm definitely gonna target him in my fantasy league. If he falls to me, I am picking him. No question about that. So you're using your first pick on him. No question about that. If he falls to me, I will pick him. Nice. And and see see my only my only thing with that is like you said, the Giants basically only have now Sterling Shepard as their as their wide receiver. As their prime receiver. And and so I I don't know if I it's consider not like the days of Burris and Cruz and Manningham. This is this is not your father. This is not you your, know your, yeah. the Giants team that won Super Bowls. Exactly. This is a completely different Giants and, team. They need to rely on every weapon in their arsenal and that's not much. And see, my problem is, is that if Sterling Shepard, I don't consider Sterling Shepard a number one wide receiver. Um, I think he could be an effective two or maybe a three. But my problem is, is that if that's all the Giants have at wide receiver, the first now, four that's all you they know, currently have at wide receiver for the first and, four games. They and you're not plugging some of the rookies they got. I have to plug in some of their free agent acquisitions that they got on offense, and they may have to plug in Barkley as a wideout. Yeah, on a few plays. Well, yeah, and see, that's my whole point is that I'm not really worried about Sterling Shepard beating me. So now I can bring my safety. So you're gonna be worried about Barkley beating you. Well, see, that's my whole point is the fact that. I can now bring my safeties closer to the box, closer to the line of scrimmage. I can bring my linebackers down. And now all of a sudden that stifles Saquon Barkley. Good as he is, that stifles Saquon Barkley a little bit because now he can't break off those, you know, four, five, six, ten yard runs that he's capable of doing because now all of a sudden He's going up against linebackers and safeties because, you know, I'm not worried about Sterling Shepard. Let, you know, let a corner, let, you know, just put one corner on him and that's fine. I'm going to bring all my guys closer to the line of scrimmage and stop Saquon. You know, it's kind of like, you know, what Dallas goes through before their wide receiver situation improved. And now I'm just wondering if that actually hurts Saquon to start the season and then once they get Golden Tate back and and maybe some of these rookie wide receivers that they have uh get some game experience and get some confidence under them you know maybe they can improve and and help and, and, and help the Giants the out off of Saquon Barkley and Sterling Shepard exactly you know that's that's kind of what what I'm feeling about the Giants is that the, that first month of the season without, without Golden Tate without there. Golden Tate there. Yeah. You know, that's, and, that's the free agent that they picked up to try and replace Odell Beckham. Yep. And I, He's and I, not as sure handed as you can get. Yeah. Without truly replacing Beckham. And I, and I like Golden Tate. Um, I, you know, uh, talked about him with, uh, Pat Ragazzo on the show before. I like Golden Tate. I think Golden Tate's a very good run after the catch receiver. Very good pickup by the Giants. A good pickup by the Giants. You, you know, outside of this little blip on the radar scale, uh, radar scale, 
Um, he hasn't had anything throughout his entire career. He's been a good teammate. You know, he's a good locker room presence, good, good. veteran leadership. I yep, he can help these rookies, these rookie wideouts come into their own. Exactly, Get and on the uh, same page as Eli. Keep Jones off the field. Yep, and and as I say, um, that that is what Dave Gellman told Eli before training camp. Eli, your job: keep Jones off the field. Yep. And, you know, and, and that's the thing. And what I'm worried about with Eli, like he's I... He's getting up there in age. He's 38, going to be turning yep. 39 soon. And, and this he, may be his last best chance to get that third ring. Uh, maybe. I, you he's know, got to keep that in mind. This may, this may be my last and best chance to get that third ring. I have to do hold down the Ford until Golden Tate returns. Have yep. to get the ball to Saquon. Got to get that ball to Shepard, however possible, and yep. make plays for myself if possible. And and the thing about it is, if the Giants start losing, if they get you know, if they have trouble at the beginning of the season, you know, they lose one game or two games in a row, um, just because you know Golden Tate's out, the young wide receivers are getting up to speed, um, whatever the case may be you know the call is going to go out mm-hmm. to bring in Daniel mm-hmm. Jones. And once once the Giants make that call to Daniel Jones, you cannot go back to Eli. Eli is a backup quarterback for the Giants at that point. And, yeah, and it may not be Eli's fault that, you know, that the Giants are losing. Eli may be playing good, but it just may be – the like line's I, not protecting him. No, the wide receivers, receivers aren't, aren't there. Catching. Yep. The defense is not work. It's not holding. Exactly. And we saw good things out of the Giants' defense in that preseason game. We saw two pick sixes. We saw good defensive stops, except on that first series. But we saw good things out of the Giants' defense. We saw the pass rush work to work well. We saw the run defense work. Uh, yep. Yeah. But I am I, concerned okay. for the defense. If they don't pick up the pace, if they don't pick up the slack, Eli's going to be a backup quarterback. Oh, absolutely. And like I said, it may not be his fault. Oh, I see the phone lines phone are lines ringing. Are ringing. Let's bring in the guest. All right. Phone lines are ringing. So let us bring in, as we have been talking about the New York Giants, let's bring in... Pat Ragazzo from USA Today Sports and Fansided.com. We want you to check out his work at Metsmerize.com and the Giants Wire. And please give him a follow at Ragazzo Report. Pat, how are you doing today? Jay, I'm doing great. How are you? Well, not doing as well as you are. You know, I'm a Phillies fan. They're going to finish behind the Mets now. Eagles lost their first preseason game last night. Uh, The Giants look like they may have their quarterback of the future. Mets are scorching hot. Things are probably looking pretty good for you, Pat. Yeah, things are looking up, Jay, lately, which we didn't expect uh, the last time I talked to you about two weeks ago. But, uh, you know, since our since our last talk on the show a couple weeks ago, uh, the Mets are red hot. They've won 13 out of 14 games, which they haven't done since 1990. Um, they have a huge weekend series um, going into City Field. Uh, the Nationals are coming to town, and the Aces are lined up with Stroman in game one tonight, Syndergaard tomorrow, and DeGrom on Sunday. So let's have a pivotal series that uh, could decide – could, if they wind up taking the series or possibly sweeping, could, uh, could uh, you know, propel them into the lead wild card spot. They're currently behind the uh, Nationals two and a half games and recently now are tied with your Phillies um, as both a half game out of the second wild card behind the Brewers. So, you know, anything could happen this weekend. It's, it's, it's playoff implications on the line, and, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Got to ask you, has opinions changed about Mickey Calloway? Um. I'd say his job's been a lot easier lately because the starting pitchers have been going seven and eight innings every start. So definitely allows him to, you know, handle the bullpen uh, a lot smoother and, you know, use his guys where he wants them because they're not pitching multiple innings every night. Um, the starting pitching has been lights out, Jay. They they went from having a, four, a 4.8 ERA in the first half, lowering their, ER, their staff ERA by a whole two runs, and they now lead the 
the All-Star break at uh, 2.8. They also have the highest win percentage since the All-Star break at 760 and also, fun, funny enough, have 741% winning percentage uh, since Brody Van Wagenen infamously threw a chair in the clubhouse. <laughs> Yeah, I'm telling you, they are just, like you said, they are just scorching hot. Um, do you think Mickey Callaway's job is safe now, or do you think they still, or do you think it's still up in the air as to whether or not the Mets bring him back? I love taking your temperature on Mickey Callaway each week. I think as long as the team continues to trend uh, in the right direction, then he's going to be back. Um, I don't think that this win streak is because of his managerial skills. I still don't think he's a poor in-game manager, but at the same time, uh, you know, the team's playing well under him, so it was obvious that they didn't quit because you can't unquit as a team, and, uh, you know, they're, they're going to wind up, I'm sure they'll hold on to him as long as they don't take a severe nosedive in the next uh, month or so, you know, and remain in the race. Um, one thing, too, for the Mets' red hot streak, they have been playing some of the weaker teams in the league. Uh, the only thing is, you know, this stretch, this 13-1 stretch is really, really notably good. That yeah. this doesn't happen very often. doesn't matter who you're playing. And at the same time, uh, on off, piggybacking off that uh, comment that I just said about about doesn't matter who you're playing, if this starting pitching staff continues to dominate like this, watch out. Nobody's going to want to face them. So, you know, they held on to Zach Wheeler at the trade deadline, which surprised everybody. And uh, they held on to Syndergaard, which was a smart move. Uh, those two have pitched tremendously since June. Syndergaard had a 2.7 ERA in the month of July. Just took home his second National League Player of the Week award uh, in his career. And uh, he has a 1.7 ERA since the All-Star break. Seems to have found his slider, uh, which is his most effective pitch. And Wheeler himself has given up three runs or less in seven of his last eight starts dating back to June 27th against the Cubs. So things are looking great. You got Marcus Stroman in his first home start tomorrow night. Jacob DeGrom has pitched amazing. Only gave up four runs in the month of July and is, is already, you know, following up, a, following up a, a great July, you know, with another solid August so far. So, you know, things are moving in the right direction, Jay. And, you know, who would have pictured this? But at the same time, we all know that this starting rotation has been capable of this for a long time. So they're finally starting to click. So it's a promising sign. Another thing I actually wanted to touch on you, though, with is the Mets went from having the worst defensive team in the league to now one of the best infield defenses in the last couple of weeks, too. And I think that's made a huge difference in their pitching as well. Oh, no doubt it absolutely has. Because when you can put a good defense behind a pitcher who's decent, that can lower his ERA and keep runners off base and make the picture look tremendous. Exactly. And, and, and also, uh, the hitters, they, these pitchers are taking pressure off, off the offense that they know that they can go out every night and that the pitchers are going to throw seven innings or two runs or less you know, on, on the majority of nights, which is to do, and it takes a lot of pressure off the hitters because they know if they can scratch across three to four runs, they'll usually win. So they could probably win a couple games. You know? And it looks like the Mets have brought in and have signed a new second baseman, Joe Panic. Can you talk about him a little bit? Now, Jay, uh, I was actually, I've been off the, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've kind of been off the grid for the last couple hours or so, but uh, you trapped inside in the office at work. But uh, did the Mets pull the trigger? Or are you saying that the Mets have, they have pulled signed the trigger. Joe Panic that are close to? Um, I believe they have pulled the trigger on Joe Panic, or I heard that they were very close to it. I heard, I heard that as well. That was the last thing that I heard, but I, ha- I haven't actually heard if they've officially signed him. But I think they may have pulled the, the trigger by now. There's more than mutual interest, and you know, once he's uh, officially a free agent this afternoon, then the Mets uh, are said to be interested and pick him up. He's a three-time World Series champion, got a very good glove. Um, you know, he's been an all-star, and he's been proven that he can hit in this league. So it's kind of a low-risk, high-reward type of deal for the Mets, especially with Robinson Cano getting that tough uh, torn hamstring and probably being out for the rest of the year. So panic, I, I love the move. Uh, I also heard that Brandon Nimmo might be on his way back soon, maybe to a restarting a rehab assignment over the next week or so. So if they could get those two guys to propel their lineup, like, you know, it could be, they could be dangerous. Um, from what I just saw, I'm looking at a tweet from a tweet from Andy Martino. Uh, Joe Panic is expected to be with the Mets for tonight's game, per his source. 
there has been a lot of reporting on this, but best I can tell, Mike Anthony 3416 first mentioned it would get done. Nice. Okay, well, that's, you know, that's a very solid move for Brody Van Wagenen, uh, who, you know, he didn't make many moves besides the Stroman deal at the deadline, but now they brought in reliever Brad Brock, uh, who was occasion. He got released by the Cubs this year, uh, yesterday, which is also a very nice piece that, you know, another low-risk, high-reward he's had success was an all-star a couple of years ago. Um, still is an effective pitcher, and he, you know, he doesn't give up many home runs. Uh, he strikes guys out. He's got a 10.4 uh, strikeouts per nine. His only problem is his walks are too high. He's got uh, six walks per nine. But at the same time, the Mets picked up Justin Wilson this year, who's been now dominant since he came back from the, from the IL. Wilson had the same walks problem with the Cubs staff last year. Wilson Contreras isn't the best. He's one of the worst framers in the league. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm not really even sure uh, what's going on with the Cubs pitching coach, but that could have something to do with it, too, that maybe uh, Phil Reagan, since, since he was taken over as Mets pitching coach, the, the pitcher's ERA is, have been, has been down uh, by over a run. So maybe he could find some success with Reagan, who's, uh, you know, like a pitching guru. And he was la- Mets were laughed at for, for hiring him, for promoting yep. him, but at the same time, you know, made the right move. He was a minor league pitching coordinator for 10 years in their system. He, uh, you know, he helped develop most of these guys in the staff. So it was a good move by the Mets, and hopefully he could help uh, Brock have some success like, like he has with Justin Wilson. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, would you be interested in taking Jason Vargas back as like a bullpen piece? You know, he could fill out those middle innings for the Mets, you know. Oh, no, don't mention Vargas. <laughs> I don't know, Jay. I mean, Jason Vargas is kind of our double agent right now. He uh, He's helping the Mets out. He helped the Mets and Phillies get tied by having a stinker of a performance in Arizona. Um, <laughs> yes, he did. Vargas, I, I liked him. He was one of a, he was one of the Mets' uh, most consistent starters this year, but at the same time, that's all he is. He's not. He doesn't throw hard enough to be effective in the bullpen. Oh, my God. He scared me when he was starting. He scared Mike here every time he would take the man. Every time yeah, he I started... Mean, couldn't go more than five. And he would always give up at least three runs in the first. Yeah, he, uh, Vargas, though, is someone who, he, uh, he's had some really tough stretches on the Mets, but really since he, he was one of their best pitchers and one of the best pitchers in baseball. But, you know, change of scenery might be throwing him off a bit. I know he had a good start last Friday where he went six and a third, but yeah. his bullpen blew it. Um, that's been an issue of theirs that, that they, you know, they haven't addressed either at the deadline. The Phillies made a couple moves, and 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 I and I, you know, I like some of the moves they made to Corey Dickerson because they did need outfield help. But at the same time, and they got some success with Bruce Miley at first, but at the same time, they didn't do anything to put themselves over the top to make the postseason. No, not at all. Not at all. Break the bank, which I applaud them for, but at the same time, you know, they can't really expect to make the postseason with all the holes they have, and and you know, Bryce Harper. Only has 19 home runs, and he's playing in Citizens Bank Park, and you know he's not even—he really hasn't—he hasn't been awful, but he also hasn't lived up to his contract. And uh, JT Realmuto too has been average. You know, he—they he, haven't played like the All Stars that they are. At the same time, the Phillies rotation, uh, everyone in the Phillies rotation, not named Aaron Nola, has struggled for the most part. Yeah, so that's where Vargas came in. I actually, you know, I, I like on the Phillies side, I like the trade because all they did was give up a a career minor leaguer, uh, 26-year-old catcher, Austin Bosart, who actually was friends with Jeff Wilpon's son, uh, was his teammate at Penn, and uh, had, was repeating double A. So at the same time, and hitting 190. So at the same time, the Phillies gave up nothing to get him. But I don't know. I, I don't think that. I think that the bullpen might wind up doing them in. And... Bullpen, offense. I've been screaming about the Phillies' offense, that it has so much potential, and they keep coming out short. They, uh, Got shut out last night, which, I mean, you would figure a lineup, that, like you said, that that can now feature Dickerson and has Reese Hoskins and Bryce Harper and, and Segura, Ria Muto in there. I mean, how, how do you get shut out? It's, like, unbelievable. And I really do think that right now the script has flipped between our two teams, uh, the Phillies and the Mets. The Mets are kind of looking like... The Phillies were looking in, in April, April and May. May, and the Phillies are looking like the Mets have been looking pretty much all season. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, the scripts are flipping, uh, you know, down a pivotal stretch in the season. 
at the same time, um, Philly, they are tremendously talented on offense, and they do have a lot of potential. So, you know, if they can catch fire in their lineup, then, you know, they might have the potential to go on a run, too. It's just, it's just a matter of if and when, and, and as long as time doesn't run out, you know, by the time they get hot. So the Bats have to need to wake up on the Philly side. And um, I don't know about you guys, but – the Phillies failed to make the postseason because Gabe Kapler. Uh, gone. He, he I mean, they gone. Uh, he is definitely, I mean, right now, the everybody in Philadelphia and who's a Phillies fan wants to throw Gabe Kapler off the Walt Whitman Bridge. But, you know, and get rid of him the sooner the better for uh, Phillies fans just because he's had this country club type of mentality where there seems to be no accountability players aren't uh, don't appear to be thinking about at bats from pitch to pitch or at bat to at bat he's flipping the lineup if you hit well one day there's no guarantee you're going to be in the lineup the next day i mean just you could be hitting anywhere in the lineup he's moved scott kingery around i mean there's just you know, there's no accountability, and the team just doesn't have it, seem to have that heart, that effort that you know that the Mets have right now, that confidence, you know, that swagger. You know, yeah, I mean, things are definitely trending in the right, uh, the right way for the Mets right now, and it's all about momentum. And that you know, they're catching fire at the right time. This I, reminds a lot of people of uh 2015, but this is about around the time when they caught fire and they had a, they had a critical. Series, home series against the Nationals that uh, they took advantage of, you know, and yep. never looked back from there. So this could be the turning point in the season this weekend. So if the Mets uh, take the series and possibly sweep them, they'll be putting the league on notice, you know, and, and size the limit for them. You got it. And we're talking with Pat Ragazzo from USA Today Sports and fansided.com. Give him a follow at Ragazzo Report and check out his work at MetsMarize.com and the Giants Wire. And speaking of the Giants Wire, Pat, Giants played their first preseason game last night. Yes, they did, and I was at the, I attended the game last night too. Very cool. So, what are your takeaways from the game? Um, it was a strange first preseason matchup, I'd say, uh, because starters came out and played a series. And then, uh, you know, Jets came out firing in their passing game. They took advantage of the Giants' young secondary, and uh, DeAndre Baker got burned on a couple plays, and so did Julian Love. They both kind of had rough games. Um, and then, and then uh, Jets, you know, scored a quick touchdown on a, on a pass uh, from Darnold to, to Chris Herndon. And then we saw the Giants starting offense, and they kind of just had a fast three and out, and Eli Manning kind of looked like he did in the first eight games last year where he was moving very slow. He was slow, and he dumped the ball three yards in front of him. You know, he looks like he's kind of scared. He looks slower, and he looks like he's, like, scared to uh, to push the ball down the field. Not That's good. A promising sign was Daniel Jones came in for the second series with the starting offensive line, which was Pat Sherman's plan all along. And – Daniel Jones surprised a lot of people. I know it's the first game, but he was he was very fast going through his progression. You know, he didn't look like a rookie who was going through the motions. He looked like a seasoned vet, made all the throws he wanted at full speed, and uh, you know, kind of picked apart the defense and put the ball wherever he wanted. And had a finish, he capped off the drive five for five on a beautiful touchdown pass in the corner of the end zone to Benny Fowler. And uh, you know, it was it was promising. And then of course the rain delay came down and. That was it. That was really the last we saw of the starters. But for the most part, uh, you know, very encouraging sign from Daniel Jones, and you hope he can build off of it in the preseason. Maybe will be a little quarterback controversy this summer after all. Daniel Jones looked very, very good. I'm, I'm surprised that he looked as good as he did. I was hoping we would get Dwayne Haskins back in April. Just wasn't meant to be. We got Jones, and he surprised the, the living daylights out of me. Did he surprise you as well, Pat, or was this kind of what you were expecting out of Daniel Jones? Um, I'd say I was a little surprised. My takeaway from that is, uh, you know, he's been doing well in practice, but at the same time, did I expect him to come out and look that fast right away? No, not at all. So we're going to see once he gets more playing time, which should be exciting this week, watch him, uh, you know, kind of progress. And see, and like, if he continues to uh, also to trend in the right direction, you know, with this team in the summer, they spent the number six pick on him that, you know, you got, Eli for farewell tour has been going on for a couple of years, and at the same time, uh, if he outplays Eli, you got to 
you got to play the best quarterback. So I think that if Daniel Jones earns it, he's six pick. I think that he should start if if he continues to to evolve this this, uh, this off season. But we'll see. Do you think we'll be seeing Daniel Jones in the regular season if something goes wrong with you? I think we Eli? will. I think that um, I, I the hope you know, the hope is that he's going to play well enough, you know, to force his way into the lineup. Um, right now the plan is for Eli to be a be the starter, of course, but uh, you know, if the team struggles, we'll definitely be seeing. How soon do you think we'll see Jones in the starting lineup in the regular season? Um, it really depends. You can't really put a prediction on it that you can't, you know, you can't think, oh, like they're gonna go two and five or something like that and be out of it, and then he's gonna play. You know, you just can't predict it. It's Giants have a pretty weak schedule in the first month. They're playing the Cowboys, Bills, Bucks. And Redskins, but at the same time, you know anything can happen. You know they could easily go two and two, three and one, and in that stretch, uh, they could wind up being in it. You know for a good, a good portion, of the, at least with their schedule, and uh, a lot of it also rides on the defense. I'm not too worried about the offense, and if Eli plays, I'm more worried about the defense. They do have a young secondary, but these guys, you know, there's going to be some growing pains with some young defensive backs, of course, and uh, Giants didn't tremendously upgrade their defense uh part of the reason was because they tr- they passed on arguably the best pass rusher in the draft in josh allen out of kentucky uh over daniel jones so that's even more of a reason for jones to be playing if he you know if he performs well this preseason i can easily see the giants going at least two and two in that first stretch without golden tate if tate didn't get suspended that'd be a three and one right there but what what do you think of these Young receivers that the Giants have that we saw in the first preseason game. Do you think we um, even have a? Sh- these young think- receivers, you know, if you, every, the alarm was sounding as Sterling Shepard broke his thumb and Corey Coleman tore his ACL, and now uh, Golden Tate's facing suspension. But at the same time, these receivers were on. Most of these receivers were on the team last year and contributed well in the second half of the season, including Benny Fowler, Russell Shepard. These guys were catching touchdown passes and making big catches. Uh, down the stretch of the season, you know, and, and being regular contributors on offense behind Sterling Shepard and Evan Ingram, who will both be playing week one. Uh, Shepard's pretty much already back barring any setbacks from his thumb injury. Of course, he didn't play last night because they're playing safe. But uh, the, I think the Giants will be fine on offense as long as their offensive line uh, performs the way that it's capable of uh, now that it's, you know, improved. Now that it's back, if, and, now and that it's back time, in full power. Um, they have Saquon Barkley, so it's just so the focus is like, keeping him healthy. And, uh, you know, he's going to open up the play-action game, and, and that will only help these receivers. So Cody Latimer had a strong finish down the stretch of the season last year. And, and Latimer, Russell Shepard, and Benny Fowler were at the same time, um, They you know, they were, they were all contributing and, and all in on the action last night. So. You know, still promising signs, and despite the narrative, uh, once Evan Ingram and Sterling Shepard are back, you know, this team should be pretty good. They also have Darius Slayton out of Auburn, too, who has yet to debut. He's been dealing with a hamstring injury, but at the same time, uh, you know, he has a lot of potential with his 4-3 speed and, and, you know, crisp route running abilities. So, you know, it should be fun. Wayne Goleman and John Hilleman, injured Giants. How big of an impact do you think that'll be for the Giants? Um... I don't think it'll be an impact just yet. Uh, Gallman pulled up, uh, got his ankle rolled up on, and he got x-rays, but they came back negative. So I think he'll be back probably soon. Uh, and then Hillman, you know, it just kind of cuts away at the uh, at the running back depth. Uh, they'll probably bring another guy in probably this week, you know, because they only had five running backs, and, and now they're down two of them. So at the same time, I think that it's unfortunately it's a tough break for Hillman because – only going to hurt his chances of making the team um he was fighting for a for a roster spot and uh you know possibly claiming that third or fourth running back spot and maybe even getting on the practice squad but you know this this doesn't help him um he's a tremendously talented kid i actually interviewed him for giants wire a couple weeks ago uh st peter's prep product so you know it's just it's just tough when guys like that who uh come into training camp you know and are trying to earn their spot on the team upper know injuries like that he's got a concussion so uh hopefully he gets has a speedy recovery we don't know how serious it is yet so could there be a scenario where at the beginning of the season eli manning plays well or plays okay but maybe because of the giants injury situation or maybe 
you know, just because it's the beginning of this season and teams are just kind of rounding into shape a little bit, um, you know, and the Giants aren't quite up to speed or just maybe a couple people have a bad game or whatnot. But Eli plays decent, decently, but the Giants wind up losing a couple of games, maybe two in a row or something like that. Do you foresee maybe um, them changing quarterbacks at that point? Even though Eli may be playing well, it's just the Giants are losing for whatever reason. They through no fault of their own. Through no fault of their own. Maybe they a ju- bad penalty. Maybe the yep. line screwing up. Maybe yep. the receivers aren't making the plays. The defense isn't making the plays. Yep. And they end up losing. Do you see the Giants making a quarterback switch then? No, I don't think so. I don't think they're going to do it until they're completely out of playoff contention. Uh, I think the plan is that they want to sit him behind Eli to learn. Eli's playing well, but they're having some tough breaks. Uh, they're going to wait. They're not going to make the change early in the season. They're going to roll with Eli and. You know, if it gets to the point where they're like two and seven, or, or, or uh, yeah, like they were last season, then I think that uh, then we'll see Jones after. But I don't think we're going to see him. Uh, they have a late bye week this week too, which is, or this year too, which is uh, kind of unfortunate because you'd expect to see Daniel Jones after the bye. But uh, their bye is not until week eleven, and then coming off the bye, they're playing at Soldier Field in Chicago, which I don't think they want him to make his debut there either. So at the same time, uh, I really don't. Again, I don't things are hard to predict with the team and everything and the record but at the same time i don't think they're going to pull the trigger until at least after seven or eight games in the season this is this actually reminds me of what the giants did when they got eli manning they sat him behind a legend in kurt warner to learn from him and when the giants fell to like four and six they pulled the trigger on eli manning um I mean, if, if if it's uh if the Giants are four and six, then again, I don't think so. I think they're not. They'll but stick with Eli. I think that they'll stick with Eli until they're totally out of it. Gotcha. And um, Pat, what do you have coming up this week at Metsmerize.com and the Giants Wire? Well, for Metsmerize, of course, we're uh, we're following uh, this recent hot streak, you know, and going to be recapping this. Uh, this important series against the Nationals, and um, you know, hopefully the, the Mets will have a wild card lead uh, at following this weekend. Here's hoping. Same Here's time, hoping. Um, going to be recapping as the Mets schedule gets a little tougher. They have the they have the Braves, they have the Cubs coming up, they have the weekend. Royals, contenders uh, over for teams over 500. So yeah, so so that's you know, things going to be busy and see if the Mets make any other uh, waiver deadline or uh, waiver moves. You know, to improve their team like they have in the last couple of days, and we'll see if these two guys have found any success in Joe Panic and, and Brad Rock. And at the same time, for Giants Wire, uh, we're going to be following all coverage and, and storylines leading up to the second preseason game and Daniel Jones. And I also have an interview coming out with Giants safety Michael Thomas. Oh, very cool. Well, um, I've been predicting it for a while, Pat, for about the last month or so, that the Mets were going to finish ahead of the Phillies. And I think that's going to absolutely come to fruition. Um, the way things are going right now, it certainly seems like it'll come to fruition. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as we've seen the last two weeks, a lot can change in baseball. This is very true. Pat, have an awesome weekend. We want to encourage everybody once again to – give you a follow at Ragazzo Report. And, Pat, we can't wait to uh, talk to you again next week. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely, Pat. Have a great weekend. Enjoy your uh, time off. Enjoy the weather. All right, Pat. And, of course, and of course, that was Pat Ragazzo. You can check out his work, like we've been saying, at MetsMarize.com and the Giants Wire. And also, like we said, give him a follow at Ragazzo Report. And also check out his work at USA Today Sports and Fansided.com. Been talking a lot of Phillies. Been talking some Eagles. Uh, It's great to have the NFL back again. Um, Lots of good things going on, except for the fact that the Eagles lost last night and the Phillies are... Uh, in the midst of bottoming out and finishing uh, behind the mess. Hmm. Um, if I can get 
this computer working. <laughs> we are having which, technical difficulties. Which always happens because this computer is notoriously slow. <laughs> so while Jay's trying to figure that out, yeah. that out I'll throw this out there. Hash, okay. Hashtag fanatic is manager. I think we should start that, see what happens for the Phillies next time. Hashtag you know. impeach Kapler. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> which one do you, which one do we go with? Or do we try both and see which Let's one? Let's do both. Let's let the uh, the, the audience decide. Okay. You know, get rid of Kaplan and put the fanatic in there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Impeach Kapler. Hashtag impeach Kapler. Hashtag impeach Kapler yeah. and what Has, was it? Hashtag fanatic as a manager. Fanatic as manager. as manager. Yeah, I think that should be. Okay. You know. Plus he could sell more t-shirts that way there you go it. put him in a suit and tie i think he'd be i think he could do it Ooh, you know you see what i'm saying see what jeff is like a marketing genius on this show I here i have my moments jay i have yeah. my moments you, you know? do you are like a marketing <laughs> genius here you know i like it yeah i gotta earn my paycheck somehow right <laughs> exactly <laughs> Oh, man, oh. this computer is so slow. Uh, oh, where are we? Did right. it get hit with a string shot attack? It must have, Wait, because is, it is not listening to anything that I'm trying to... I think I saw Kaplan in here or to... something. I think he was messing around with our computers. That's why it's not working. It could be. <laughs> he must have had a Caterpie. I know. He <laughs> must have. I'm telling you. You know, it's not doing Pokemon anything reference. that I wanted. It's not doing anything I wanted to do. Uh -oh. It's acting up on, oh, it moves slightly. Yeah, there we go. It moves slightly. There we go. <laughs> it's not a lot. Ah, uh, let's see. Maybe it, maybe the mouse is messed up. Ah, uh, okay. I think we're getting to where I want to go. The Hold end. On. <laughs> yeah, the end of the show. Yeah. Uh, the ER. Oh, uh, man. Come on. Hashtag, you could do it, Jay. Hashtag Jay can do it. Jay can get to where he wants to go. Oy, it's just going to take him pitch? forever to get there. Where's the pitch? Yeah. <laughs> Another Pokemon reference. <laughs> That's okay. My friend, my friend and his daughter play that, by the way. They play Pokemon Go? Uh, they have it on their cell phones. Yeah, that's and... Pokemon Go. Yep. I play it, yeah. too. I'm a level 32 on Team Valor. Oh, okay. I'm a level 5 because I just don't like it. <laughs> get them our level see i always forget to play it like i have it downloaded on my phone because i started uh like uh occasionally uh playing it with him and um well you know what they have the harry potter go now out there oh that. do they yeah so harry can... potter wizards unite yeah exactly so that's out there now. i was waiting for that but i cannot get it on my phone because it's not compatible oh that bites. Right. yeah know, tell me about it I was looking for it because I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. Guys. What do you want to do? Harry Potter or Pokemon at the whatever location it's you're at? Getting it's like, oh, which one do I get better? Come on. Oh, getting you know, getting the site to load. It is loading. <laughs> taking his taking its little little time here, but uh it is loading. Kind of like Manon taking his time to get out there. Yes. Throwing those passes this like is... extra slow. Uh, just doesn't have the power anymore. You know, I mean, he has experience. He uh, just doesn't have the... And they have ooh. him a 74 uh, overall in Madden 20. Yeah. Which will be out uh, uh, the 16th of this month, so I'm looking forward to that. Not to shamelessly plug a video game, but <laughs> it is Madden, so, you know, I'm sure everyone out there knows oh, about it. I could so take you in Madden. Hey, as long as the Eagles win the Super Bowl in it, I don't care. No. I that, could so take you down in Madden. Uh, okay, challenge. Ah, uh, there's a challenge here <laughs> issued on the Sports Skiller Radio Show. Hashtag, yeah. he doesn't know me very well, does he? <laughs> <laughs> You've never seen me in Madden. Ah, uh, there you go. It's okay. We have, uh, we have you don't know a me Madden. too well either. I don't like. Uh, come on. It's all friends. It's okay. It is. <laughs> uh, nice. Yeah. Still no luck, Jay. It's it's moving. Uh, okay. Oh, it's boy. moving. It's moving. All right. What can we fill this with? You know. You know. What? You know. It is moving. We're getting there. I know. We're trying to fill this, however possible. Exactly. With with good conversation here, which is what you get on the Sports Skill live stream. Exactly. You get talk. You know what other, you know, live stream do you get talk about Harry Potter oh, and no. Pokemon yeah. and uh, shameless plugs for Madden. Yeah. You know? uh, shameless plugs for Madden. Play. You know what the exactly. Yeah. I mean, we could turn to wrestling, but uh, well, that's what I'm trying to bring up. Now. 
Oh, See? that's what it is. Okay. Yes. All Elite Wrestling, trying to bring that up because we have to wait a little bit on that one. No. We do yeah. have to wait a little no. bit for another few months for All Elite Wrestling. Not in front of me. Not do that. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Actually, I gave up wrestling in the 80s, end of the 80s when the 90s started. I think, that, the I think the it's fixed. Started. I think wrestling is fixed. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> I think boxing is fixed too. Yeah. Oh no, boxing! I don't think so. I think it uh, it all depends on how it's much fixed. they're being paid to fall. It's fixed. In but, the conversation, it's fixed. But wrestling, uh, it's it's more of the storylines. It's not really the athleticism. I mean, they just throw they, each other around the ring and hopefully not hurt themselves. <laughs> uh, if I can get this to come up, you can do it, Jay. We believe in you. I know. Uh, so we got SummerSlam coming up this weekend. Mm. Yes, we do. Brock Lesnar versus Seth Rollins. Um, I am going to go with Seth Rollins on that one. Uh, let's see. We've got the Raw Women's Champion Becky Lynch versus Natalia in a submission match. I'm going to say Becky Lynch retains her title there. Um, we've got Kofi Kingston, WWE champion against Randy Orton. I'm going to say that Kofi Kingston is going to win that one. Uh, SmackDown women's champion, Bailey versus Ember Moon. Hmm. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Bailey on that one. I think she'll beat Ember Moon. Kevin Owens versus Shane McMahon. I am going with KO on that one. Trish Stratus versus Charlotte Flair. I think that one will be a pretty good match. Trish Stratus makes her WWE return. But I'm going to say the Queen Charlotte Flair is going to win. Um, Goldberg versus Dolph Ziggler. Goldberg, Goldberg is coming in. You know Goldberg is going to win. So well, Maybe not. They probably just brought him in just to lose. Just to- nah, I don't, see, I don't see that happening. Yeah. Um, you know, so... I, I just don't see that. Uh, where did you go? Uh, <laughs> let me go forward. Uh, let's see what we got. Uh, what did I just Goldberg versus Dolph Ziggler. United States champion AJ Styles defends against Ricochet. I'd like to see Ricochet take the title, but I think AJ Styles is going to retain it. Uh, Finn Balor versus The Fiend, Bray Wyatt. I am going to go with The Fiend, Bray Wyatt in that one. Um, Bray Wyatt making his return. WWE Cruiserweight Champion, Drew Gulak versus Oni Lorcan. I'm going to go with Oni Lorcan taking the title in that one. And uh, there you pretty much have the rundown for the SummerSlam card coming up on uh, this Sunday. So... Now that, you can only see that on pay-per-view, right? Well, they you can get it on pay-per-view, but they air it on the WWE Network. Oh, they do? Okay. You know, that's primarily where you get it. You order the WWE Network, you get one month for free, and whatever pay-per-view is on that month, that's the uh, pay-per-view you get for free. And that's what people do. They do it yeah. for one month or one day and then cancel it. Cancel it. it. Exactly. Yep. Oh, now you we know. have WrestleMania. Okay, one day. Okay, done. <laughs> <laughs> But I do, before we sign off, I do want to talk a little bit, um, because I meant to do this last week, Mike, with you. I do want to talk a little bit NASCAR with you. Because I know you're big about NASCAR, so... That um, gave it away, didn't it? It did, just a little (laughs) bit. You know, so talk a little bit about NASCAR. Where is, like, NASCAR currently in their season? This week, they're heading off to Michigan. It's a tricky two-mile oval, race 23 of the season. After this, we got three races left before the chase begins, and this is a manufacturer battle. We're not that far off from Detroit in the this week, and okay. I'm looking at a couple of I'm looking at a couple of drivers who do really well at Michigan: Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott. Okay, Larson got his first win here here at this track in Michigan in 2014, outlasting Chase Elliott. He had a three race win streak at Michigan, all against Chase Elliott, but I'm expecting Elliott to finally break through at Michigan and beat Kyle Larson. Okay. So if he does that, does he move up in the standings? It'll or... be his third win of the season. Okay. And he'll get another 
I think, 10 playoff points for win for winning a race. Okay. Very cool. And um, as we go in... And, and that will go down Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern over on NBCSN. Okay. Very yeah. cool. After that, we get one of my favorite races on the year. Bristol, the night race at Bristol. Okay, and why is that your favorite race? Short track, short temper, anything can and will happen. A, a lot of crashes happen there? Or yes, no? a uh, lot of crashes happen there, and possibly, possibly, fights. Really? Well, it's at it, night. They have to drive with Bristol. headlights on. <laughs> Tracks oh, wow. always I know lit. they don't. I know they don't. Nice. It's Bristol. <laughs> So it's gonna flare, man. So that would be not this weekend, but the following weekend. No, NASCAR. Or, or, uh, it'll be next week. It'll be next Saturday night. Okay. 7 p.m. on NBCSN. Then an off week. Then we get another one of my favorites, the Southern 500 at Darlington. Okay. 60 plus years of history. It's a throwback weekend. Throwing back to the 90s with the paints games. Oh, nice. Very cool. So the drivers will have that 90s painted cars and yes, stuff like that. throwback paint schemes. Nice. nice. Any predictions on that race? Who do you think might win it? I'm going to have to dig into the Gibbs stable for this one. Okay. I'm going to pick Hamlin, Denny Hamlin in the 11 car. Okay. Very cool. And we wrap up the regular season at the Brickyard, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, final race of the regular season. And I'm going to be picking rookie... Former Rookie of the Year, defending Rookie of the Year, William Byron. To win that one? Yes. Interesting. Now, Any why reason? why are you picking him? Just because of his driving ability, his car, I think it's his pick I crew? think it's time he broke out and got a win on the season. William Byron will win at Indianapolis and break into, the, into the NASCAR's chase. Nice. Very cool. All right. We will be paying attention to that. And I want to uh, encourage everybody to uh, give us a follow at sportskillerradio.com. We've got some good things going on. Again, we're going to be uh, putting out a challenge for our Pick'em League. We're going to be uh, starting up our, um, our Fantasy Football League. And we got a unique opportunity for everyone out there as well. Uh, to play along with Joe Montana. So we want to have you go ahead and do that. Again, all the details will be on our social media sites, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So you want to pay attention and it'll be up on our website as well. Thanks everybody for tuning in to the Sports Skilla live stream this week. And we will see you next week around 12 o'clock. Have a great week. And remember, 11 a.m. Sunday morning, SportsKillerRadio.com or Fox Sports Radio 920, The Jersey. We want to see you, hear you, tuning in there. The phone number for that show is 609. Now say this out loud as you're driving. 8883 609-609. Uh, just tune in to the Sports Killer Radio <laughs> show on Sunday morning. We'll have the numbers up for you then. Have a great week, everybody. Live long and prosperous, sports fans. You can have a sports show without all the vicious talk. Simple human decency. Whatever it is that you like. <laughs> yeah, I like chaos. We've got it covered. Right? Right? It's sports the way you like it. My friends, you may not know this. It's got everything you want. Here we go. Local and national sports talk that's fresh, in season, and FDA approved. If it's hot, you'll find it cooking with Jeff, Jay, and Kelly. Mm -mm. They don't just stir the pot. They add more flavor than the other guys. Get ready to dig in and taste some sports skillet. Ooh, tastes good. Right now.